It's a pleasure to welcome you to the program. My name is Felicity Ezewike. A Google search of the phrase, religion as a political tool in Africa, brings up a bountiful collection of scholarly articles that doesn't seem to be any debt of material on the subject. So why would we be talking about it today? Let's try and establish contest briefly. Christianity and Islam are leading religions in Africa, but has not completely displaced the traditional indigenous ones. We still have atheists and agnostics. There's also the historical interconnections between religion and colonialism, for which almost all parts of the continent endured. All the history is full of examples of how religion has always played a key role in the political decisions of a people. In Christianity, for example, Jesus Christ became a target of persecution from birth because he was perceived to be a king. Similarly, in Islam, jihads are used to overthrow governments and political structures to establish Islamic caliphates. The subject of religion and politics, while very intriguing, has remained highly contestable, and this is reflected in an abundance of scholarly materials. While some scholars think that religion should be insulated from politics, Others say no, it is a serious imperative in political activities. Now, it is no longer a question really whether there is a relationship. What our conversation today seeks to explore, among other things, is the implications of religion and politics interacting. What history tells us about religion being weaponized or used as a tool in politics and possibly what an ideal role or relationship should be between both. My guest is a professor of religious studies in the Department of Religions and Peace Studies, Lagos State University, Nigeria, West Africa. His PhD in religious studies comes with a specialization in the philosophy of religion. He is widely published and has served as the regional representative for West Africa for the African Association for the Study of Religion. Welcome and thanks for joining us giving us your time as well, Professor Oguntola Danoye Laguda. Thank you for joining us again. Good evening, and uh, it's a pleasure for being here. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this conversation again. Indulge me, sir. Paint for us a picture of Africa from history before colonialism and its brand of religion, as briefly as you can. Well, um, it's a bit uh, difficult to talk of uh, uh, religion in Africa as one, or to talk about models of religion in Africa as one. Of course, we have to go back to the basics, which is the fact of uh, religion, uh, what religion holds uh, for people, and how people have responded to religion as the phenomenon, uh, metaphysical as well as social institution uh, globally. Now, when you narrow it down to Africa, it becomes uh, a bit important for us to consider to consider the fact of uh, religion hegemony and uh, also the religion uh, 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 value to the people of Africa. Having said that, if you permit me to go further, I will say that uh, religion to the African people has been all in all. Like, uh, like Bola G. Dohurani said, Africans are in all things religious. Ditto for John and Bitti. Yokbamu and Awola Lu in their book, West African Traditional Religion, also said the same thing. And which I agree with, that there's no, no sphere of African life that does not have religious in it. And in all things that we do in Africa, religion to be, seems to be the matrix upon which we, uh, we, we do our analysis, upon which we take our decisions, upon which we formulate our policies, even at the government level. So it, it, it becomes interesting when you now look at how religions we, we start from the level of individual, from the mind of individual, and from the mind of individual, it trans, uh, translates into group reality. And from group reality, it becomes a national consciousness uh, uh, that everybody seems to key in. And it is from this level of interaction and level of uh, formulation that you can talk about religion becoming a system and then you now bring it in and now put a name to it. 
And we now start talking about Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Zulustanism, Confucianism, African traditional religion, and Islam. I hope okay. this answered the question. Um, in a way, it did, but I was hoping so we could uh, create a premise for, for, to go further in the conversation. Like, there was a system. We, we, we sort of had religion before we had colonialism, right? So what was the uh, environment? What does history I, 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 tell us about the environment then? I don't, I don't think so. On the contrary, I think we have communalism before we have religion. Okay. Uh, because what you call religion is not something that uh, that is just uh, can be defined in just uh, in just one word, or, and I will say I'm correct. But if you go to the etymology of the word religion, you see you're talking about religare or ligare, and both of them are derived from Latin words, which simply means to bind. So for somebody, so for something to come up as a concept. It must emerge from the responsibilities of individuals, the consciousness of individuals and groups that binds them or that links them to another reality. And it is that bond, that bond that is known etymologically as religion. So when you look at it from Sigismund Freud perspective, you see that it is more like a consciousness in us that creates a direct contrasting things like the fear fear and at the same time fascination you have right. you have fascination because you are drawn to god because you want to go to god at the end of the day but then as well when you go in the presence of god you be, you become afraid and that fear becomes a very critical factor when you try to define religion in other words it is the fear of failure fear that we are not sure of the environment we are living fear that we are not sure that there is going to be a tomorrow. Fear that we are not sure that after death there is going to be something. So all of this, in the okay. Year after. Yeah. Okay. So I'm I'm trying to put it so the person who is not as scholarly as you will still be able to you know grasp it as much as possible. But let's move further. You've established what religion should look like. Um, should be. Um, what constitutes religion basically? So I want to ask you. Uh, from your uh, position of, you know, having studied this and, you know, all the uh, conversations that go around it, how would you say religion, as it were, in all forms, have impacted Africa? Well, religion has been uh, has, has positive impact on Africa. And we have to take that historically. Before the coming, in the pre-colonial Africa, it was one religion which is, you can call, the traditional religion of the African people. And I hope those who don't believe in the hegemony of Africa will forgive that expression. But at the same time, when we, when we have only African traditional religion, our economy, our politics, our social life, our cultural life are determined by that one religion. Unfortunately, in, during the colonial Africa, when, when we are under colonialism, the colonial masters came with their own religion in, in various guise and various uh, uh, dimensions. And that seems to kind of split us into camps. We now become Christians, we now become Muslims, we now become traditionalists. And so there are some parts of Africa where Oriental religions like Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, Confucianism, and the rest of them uh, are now thriving. So if you ask me, I think the, the, the determinant factor is the fact that in Africa today, because of the pluralism that we have in terms of religion or multiplicity of religious experience, we cannot directly lay claim to one religion determining our social realities, our economic realities, and political realities, as, as the case may be. So and that is why you find diversities in terms of beliefs, diversities in terms of conce and conception, diversity in terms of policies, and diversity in terms of how to apply our religious belief into our social life. And then it becomes difficult, sometimes if not impossible, to also talk about spirituality or religion, and then you bring it into the public life, and then the, our social activities and engagement. All right. in, in my introduction, I, I said something about it no longer being a question whether there is a relationship between religion and politics, which is uh, the topic of this conversation, religion as a tool in politics. So um, I said in my introduction that it doesn't seem to be in question whether there is a relationship. And I came to this inference based on some of the things that I've read 
um, materials that's been written on it. So I'm, my question to you would be, uh, was I far off the mark? Is there an, a connection between religion and politics? There's no running away from the fact. In my own thesis, in my own uh, study and my conversations over time, in my almost three decades of engagement in religion as a study, as a, an academic pursuit, I have done one or four, between five and uh, seven works on religion and politics. I can tell you that there is, a, I mean, a symbiotic relationship between politics and religion, and they rub on, and they rub off on each other. That could fundamentally be because, one, because it is about human beings. Human beings are involved in politics. Human beings are the objects, are the subject of religion. And the, the basic thing is, whether you look at it as subject or object of religion, the basic thing is that you can see religion as a human institution or a social institution where people must get engaged in. And if you look at policies on the other one, on the other hand, if you go beyond the literary interpretation of politics, which is the struggle for power, you, you cannot divide, uh, divorce the fact that humanity, human beings as a whole, or as groups or as society as a whole, are involved in political uh, struggle and political agitation, as well as the polit politics of the life of a nation which is the struggle for the control of power and the management of power, vis-a-vis -vis development of state, maintenance of development, and looking at the issue of uh, cultural stability and economic stability of the polity within which politics and religion are interacting. But then let me warn that the nature, the nature of the religious being practiced in a particular society determine the interaction that is possible between religion and politics. For example, in a religiously uh, homogeneous society, and you can take Rome, Vatican Rome, for example, Saudi Arabia, Arabia for example, uh, you can take Bangladesh to some extent, and then you can also talk of other countries in that realm where there's only one religion in practice. It is very easy for religion to determine politics and politics to determine how religion itself must be practiced and vice versa. But in a religious polarities society like Nigeria, it becomes a bit complex and difficult. And the complexities need to be addressed before we can start talking about this interaction, whether it is positive or negative. But in my own, in my own uh, thinking and understanding, in Nigeria, our experience down the line from pre-colonial period to the post-colonial period that you can talk about now is that religion oftentimes determine our politics. And there is no running away from the fact. Even our constitution, party constitution sometimes recognize that religion and politics must interact for them to be able to negotiate for votes from the uh, from the from the masses, from the people that who have uh, uh, who are franchised to vote. And that we go to underline the fact that there is no way you want to talk about politics and you will not talk of religion. And there's no way you will not talk of you talk of religion without talking politics. Because even in the religion itself, within religious groups and religious uh, epistemology, there are politics. If you look at the popular saying in the Bible, I mean, the one that uh, give unto Caesar what is Caesar and to unto God what is God, that is a political statement from Jesus Christ. You know, they were trying to put him on the back foot, pinning down to a particular aspect where he would say he support the civil government. And he said, no. Look, who is on the coin? Whose picture is on the coin? And the picture of the person on the coin is Caesar. Then give unto Caesar what is Caesar, and then give to God what is of God. That's a very big political statement. It saved the situation. And if you look at it critically well, in the history of the church, you will, it was the involvement of Constantine, Emperor Constantine, in the process of Christianity that made Christianity a state religion and thereby giving Christianity a very good uh, platform on, uh, upon which to express its doctrines as well as its philosophy. And uh, also the, 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 the concept of uh, social life for the Christians. If you go to Islam too, we have the same thing. We have the same principles in Islam, where the leader of the religion is also the political leader of the people. And as such, you cannot divorce the fact of uh, the man that is leading the country is also the, the, the political, uh, the religious leaders of the people. Okay. And if you go into a traditional religion, it's almost the same thing. For example, in Nigeria, in Yoruba land, at Oshoshobo uh, Festival, for example, the, the, the monarch 
that is a Tauja of Oshobo, must lead the worship of, uh, of, of Oshobo at, at every time, uh, annually, when they are going into what they call Oja. Okay, that's, uh, that's the way they use it. Like, and going to that, he must provide leadership. He's the one to lead uh, them into the groove, awaiting the arrival of Aruba before you can commence. What I am trying to establish, or yeah. uh, if you follow me very well, that, what yeah. I've been able to establish is that in our own situation, in Nigeria, for example, religion and politics have been interacting. They should interact because they are human social institutions. And I think I can expand on that later in the program. Thank I, you. Hope, I do hope that we'll be able to do that as well. But I, you, you mentioned um, how religion can sometimes determine you know, the kind of politics that we play. You, um, the instance you cited with Saudi Arabia, Arabia is uh, quite... Um, obvious. I want to ask, um, from your vantage point, uh, how would you describe the relationship between, uh, let me rephrase that, how would you describe the relationship between politics and religion in present day Africa? Because we've been, we've, we are a mixture of everything. You said it. We have the traditional religion. We have the Islam. We have Christianity. We have those who don't believe in God, so to speak. So how do, how do you describe that dynamics in Africa? Which would you say is maybe higher or does it even play any role? Well, it does. It plays a significant role. There's no running away from that. Let me take you up from the last statement. I, 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 I will not deny the fact there are some pockets of people who will tell you they don't believe in God, but they believe in something. And as such, I don't see them as atheists. I only see them as people who don't believe in God, but who believe in other things. And uh, if you like, you want to mention Professor Walesho Inka, for example, you want to mention Taishulan, for example, they believe in something. And that is why some scholars of religion will be correct in saying, and Bolaji Do precisely will be correct in saying there is no atheist in Africa. And then if you don't, if you agree with that, that will mean that if there, is, there are no atheists in, in Africa and by Nigeria for uh, particular, then you will see that there is no way we want to practice politics without bringing theism, which is a concept of God, into our politics. And we have to be very, very conscious and careful about that. We cannot deny our reality. Now, to say that in Africa, let, let's extend it now to the question on Africa. Now, let us discuss religion as one. I don't want us to look at religion in my response here as a function of the diversities or types of religion that we have in our polity. But if we look at it critically in Africa, religion influences politics and politics influences religion. Let's take Zimbabwe, for example. In their election, religion does not uh, really, really take uh, much influence in terms of whether we are a Muslim or you are a Christian, because the Muslim population in Zimbabwe are almost insignificant. But then if you look at the Zimbabwe population, almost everybody who profess Christianity are also involved in African traditional religion. And when they go into their politics, you will not see them talk of polit polit a religion as a denominator. But immediately the governor or the government comes into it, into place. It becomes a very major factor in determining policies of government. I can remember the, the, the issue on homosexuality. I can, I mean, same-sex marriage and the rest of that. I, I, I mean, it was a very critical, uh, very issue that nearly tear the whole quality of Zimbabwe apart. But what do we have at the end of the day? We have a situation where the president the late uh, Mugabe was using Catholicism as a response to homosexuality, was using Christianity as a response to homosexuality. And you start to wonder, is this man supposed to provide civil leadership or religious leadership? So ba ba basically, you, you cannot, you, well, I'm, I'm getting from what you're saying, that you cannot separate the African from his religion. It doesn't matter exactly. the level of education exactly. they have. Exactly. It is an integral exactly. part. Okay, I think this yes. is a good point for us to just take a little break.
Good to know you're still with us. Let's continue. Now, both religion and politics have one common goal, to acquire power and to use it to fulfill their aims. My question to the prof now would be, what intersections can you draw from these? Well, I, let me start on a note of saying that I don't agree that religion is all about acquiring power. First, let me clarify that very well, that you can understand my thesis and my okay. take on this question. Please go ahead, because I was going to interject, but just go ahead. But for me, religion is about uh, the fact of trying to get into the act of drawing yourself to the numinous, which is God in some cases, and uh, which could be the state in some cases, and which could also be uh, the social environment in some spaces. And then religion as a social institution may not necessarily about acquire acquisition of power. Well, you said yourself, you if, I may, if I may interject uh, before you continue, you said yourself earlier that um, sometimes this, you were describing what religion was. You mentioned fear. You mentioned a sense of, um, I think you mentioned something about hopelessness, trying to connect with a higher being, right? And in order for some of these things to happen, there has to be a measure of power. Because if there is no power, okay. if you don't believe in a higher power, the tendency is there <laughs> that you will not be afraid of anything. OK, I think we are, we are, this, we are, we are talking about power from different perspectives. Okay. Uh, I, 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 you, you got me into that because I thought you were saying power in religion and power in politics. Power in terms of uh, politics is to control, is to get control of the state and to also be able to provide leadership and governance. Yeah, that was what I was asking. I was saying there is a similar element in both religion and politics, and that element yeah. is power. So I was asking if maybe that is where the relationship comes and becomes a little bit uh, confusing. I would, I would disagree. That is not where the relationship starts from. I would rather prefer to say that it starts from the fact of both institutions are human institution, human based institution. And because it is because there is humanity, that is why you talk about God. Because if there is no humanity, there will be no religion in the first place. Because no matter what you want to think about the mystical or the mystics, about the dynamic of religion, you will agree with me that without those who worship uh, the mystics or the mystical power, there is nothing called religion. The same thing for politics. If human beings are not involved, what is going to be politics? So if you, I would rather say that the, the real issue is about humanity getting involved in them. And that is where the similarity starts. And I will not say that is where it ends. Because at the end of the day, there is this issue of manipulation or trying to adapt and appropriate one in the context of the other. For example, religion trying to appropriate politics for its own benefit, like I've mentioned, mentioned the example of uh, Emperor Constantine, and politics trying to appropriate religion for also for its own benefit in, in terms of negotiation for vote, for example, in terms of negotiation for peace, for example. You remember in the military experience in Nigeria, whenever there is going to be any social crisis, there will be there's going to be a congregation. Uh, I mean, invitation uh, to ecumenism, bringing the Muslims, the Christians, and sometimes traditional rulers together and then tell them, go and talk to your people. That religion at that point becomes a tool of social negotiation that is going to interact with the people. So I think humanity should be seen as the real thing that connect politics with religion. Now let us now look at power within the way you have mentioned it. If, if power becomes a denominator in this relationship, then we are, only, we are going back to look at religion not as a social institution, but look at such religion as a spiritual institution, a mystical institution, a, 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 an institution that have more esoteric values than social values. And I'm sure some social scientists will not agree with my position on that. They will tell you that they will not agree that they, they will tell you that religion is nothing but a social institution. And that is what Mete Yinga will always argue in his thesis, when, when he talks about uh, spirituality as a counter-narrative or counter-production uh, uh, counter against the position of religion. So I, I, I would rather think that why power is very critical in the two, we have to say that the definition and usage of power in the context 
of the two institutions we are discussing are not the same, and they should not be seen as the same. But at the social level, both institutions can always interact because one is going to use the other, appropriate the other for his own benefit, and the other is going to appropriate the other for its own benefit as well. But then they can live separately in some context. I, I guess that's the importance of conversation like this, to get different perspective on this very exactly. important subject. So uh, moving on, let's, let's look at an aspect, um, the, the influence religion has. You, you've alluded to that um, repeatedly here. Uh, but let's look at how it affects political choices that people make across Africa. What sort of political decisions do you think um, religion influences people to make? Is it, it, does it help, let me just uh, paraphrase that, does it um, um, help towards making the right decisions to, uh, making the decision to vote particular candidates or even making the decision to be a part of the electoral process? How does religion <laughs> influence people? <laughs> well, uh, the political stage, or let me use the word theater in Africa, is a very, very dramatic uh, thing to consider where people will say that uh, I, I, I got, uh, I got uh, the word from heaven. Yes, uh, I've, been, in, uh, <laughs> I've been called by God. I've been called I've been by called, God to I've lead the people. I've been called by God to go and contest <laughs> for election. And some people will even tell you where in the Bible it has been suggested that uh, they will win the election. I remember uh, Pastor Aguru in 2000, and uh, I think it was 2003, the pop, there was a presidential candidate of one of the parties there. He's saying that he doesn't know whether there will be election or there will be election is going to be installed as president of Nigeria come 1st of October 2003. So what, what this always suggests to us is that some of these things that these people say, all right, it, it, it are not really as true, if you want me to use the word true, or, or correct in the sense in which they are using them. You see, you cannot say that uh, you have you, you have been driven or driven by religion to go into politics. I would not agree with that, because the, 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 if you look at the esoteric value of religion, God is not human, and human are not God. We are only striving to be like God. So to say that you hear the voice of God is a subjective matter. And being subjective, it means there will be perspective to that particular context. So I don't think it is about saying that uh, religion uh, is influencing politics or politics is uh, re uh, influencing religion. I say that uh, politics, uh, religion has driven me into political sphere. I, I, I would disagree with that. Although I will agree that there is no way a, a political leader will get to office without necessarily bringing his or her whole religion into play, into office, and that religion will determine what an he or she will do as a leader in the context where it is, uh, where the person is, being, is practicing. Yeah, that, mean, that's we, going we, to take we, me to the, the, to the next question. Sorry to interrupt you, but before we do, I think you only address the issue of leaders, how some of these leaders come about to get the people to be a part of their own campaign. Um, I'm talking, I'm, I, I want you to address the part about the people themselves. How do you think religion influences? Because one thing is for the person who is canvassing for their votes to say he's been nominated by God. And another thing is for the <laughs> citizens to choose to believe that that person has been nominated. So I want you to you know, speak a little on how people make their choices inspired by I, their belief in religion. I, I, I did a survey in 2007 at uh, one major church, I don't think I have to mention the name of the church, uh, <laughs> yeah. among about 500 worshippers. And I asked them uh, what is going to be their position in the election for 2007. And then what I got is nothing, it, it has nothing to do sincerely with religion. It was interesting to me because it was a time when the, that particular church was appropriating and inviting leaders of Nigeria and some other countries. It also happened in Zimbabwe that they will have to, on the eve of election, they must visit some of the ritual spaces for them to be able to converse for the vote of members of the church. But to answer your question directly, don't forget that the, 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 the masses, those who are involved, okay, for example, let's use Nigeria as an example. In the, in, in the political process, looking at it from the voters' perspective, are religious people. 
and they are members of one religious group or the other. And they have a leader. And the leader of that religious group becomes the, the, the real factor, the, nom the, the, the dominator and the negotiator in chief on behalf of his flock or followers or congregation, if you like that expression, borrowing it from uh, the Christian point of view. And then, so, you, like you have shown a picture of some of Nigerian religious leaders going into and meeting the leaders of some religious denomination. What are they doing that for? Yeah, this is the picture I was referring to. And then what are they doing there for? This is the Catholic leadership being consulted by uh, President Muhammad Buhari. The question is why? So the Catholic Synod, or the Catholic Synod, which is the highest making body in Catholicism in Nigeria, will go back to their members and now make their position known that, look, if we vote Buhari, it's going to be good for us in the election, A and B, A, B, C. And if we don't vote Buhari, it's going to be good for us in this election. It, it, is it possible that even, even, even if they don't say anything, the mere fact that they are seen with leaders, Buhari or whoever that leader may be, the mere fact that these religious leaders are seen with these um, uh, leaders, political leaders, yes, if, don't you think it, it also has a role to play in how their followers decide? They're, because some of them will come up and tell you that if you see me with a, a political leader, it doesn't mean that I have endorsed him. But then again... Uh, that, that is, that, yes, that is correct. The last statement you made is very correct. And in, for, for this conversation, I think it's the critical point that we need to consider. Because, look, you're going into... I mean, seeing me with a, a political leader and I'm a religious leader does not mean endorsement. It, is, it has come to a point in our polity today in Africa where religious people are also seeking relevance. And what they do is simply to welcome the political aspirant or candidate, as the case may be, into their fold, sometimes speak the truth to them about the situation of the country, ask them to put it in the agenda A, B, C, D. This is what our people are looking forward to. And this is what we, 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 we want the next president or the next governor of a state or president of a nation to do for us. And they pray for the leader in question, like this picture is also showing here. Yeah. And at the end of the day, it doesn't mean that they are going to converse for votes. That's another thing I discovered in my conversation, that it doesn't mean they are going to actually converse for votes. For the, for the for the aspirant or the uh, but, but, but that's it's, also on that, that that's I agree with you in that aspect. But you know that you know, in, in every population there are those who are educated, middle education, and those who don't even have any kind of education. And their leaders, anything their leaders do is a sign of I mean, they read signs into everything that their leaders do. The mere fact, do you think that can sway members of a congregation who see their pastor or priest? in constant interaction with a certain political leader when it comes to elections? You are very correct, especially when they see their, their leaders as a symbol of their congregation or their, or their denomination, as the case may be. So if you see it that way, and you believe that your leader cannot lead you astray, which is what I said when you define religion as a binder, as a bond, something that binds you together, and then you, it binds you with a symbol and that symbol in this question becomes the leader of your religion. Definitely, you are swayed. You, 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 you want to toe the line of your leader and say that, well, our leader is towing the line of ABCD, and ABCD is what we are going to vote for. But that is why I was creating that caveat, that it may not necessarily play out that way. People may see the leaders as towing line ABC, and they go for XYZ. It could be because of education, it could be because of enlightenment, it could be because of political literacy. So there, I'm, I'm, I'm inferring from what you're saying that we should begin to make, in, um, we shouldn't be jumping to conclusions, but at the same time, there needs to be some sort of um, adjustment in the relationship between uh, political leaders and religious leaders. Yeah, well, I, I, I will agree with you reluctantly. <laughs> Why we love <laughs> You see, I, 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 am a, I am a student of religion, and I have to be very careful. Careful in the sense that I don't want to make a statement where somebody will tell me tomorrow that that is my thesis. No, it is not. It may not be correct. Okay. But I think it can work both ways. Okay? It could inform the position of the voters who are members of uh, a religious group, just like it could even make them not to agree 
to the position of their leader. And I give you an example. I cast your mind back to 2015. You remember very well the candidates of PDP in that 2015 presidential election in Nigeria went to, I mean, to Ogu State. If I mention the name of the king now, you will know the aspirants I'm talking about, uh, candidate I, I'm talking about. And the guy asked them to pray the traditional way for him to win the election. The man refused. The, the monarch refused to make the prayer, rather calling his, his attention to the fact that the country is suffering. And you need to address that. We and need to respond to the suffering of the nation. And that's not the, that you want to be our leader again. And that's an important role, really. We're, I'm hoping we'll explore in the last segments of uh, this uh, conversation. But quickly, if you can, in 30 or 40 seconds, I want you to speak on uh, what are some of the effects of using um, religion as a tool for political mobilization. I know we've touched it here, you've touched it here and there, but if you can just speak specifically on, to it in another 30 seconds. The first thing is that Nigeria, for example, Africa as a whole, believe that religion is going to dictate whatever they do in their life. It's going to determine them. And this kind of determinism suggests that it is what their leaders tell them that majorly they will do. Some of them may dissent and refuse to do that, but then majorly, many of them will toe the line of the leadership. And that is where religion starts to have effects on our political uh, demography, especially in terms of result. If, if, if you look at the history of religion in Nigeria, elections in Nigeria, and you can bring religion in, religious, religion in, in terms of candidacy, and then you can now come to a conclusion that the, the, the Southeast Nigeria will vote a Christian candidate, <laughs> at the expense of a Muslim candidate. And you can okay. say the North and uh, not East, not West Nigeria, we vote the Islamic candidate at the expense of a Christian candidate. If you come to the Southwest, you can talk about the balance, 50-50. And that tells you about the religious environment where within which we are looking at the politics and religion. So the All environment right. in Southwest, for example, is a 50-50 situation. Some people will not give their conscience to religion. Oh, and religion. some people say, well, he's our leader. Immediately our leader says, this is where we go, and this is where we go. Thank a really you. dicey situation. All right, one slot Very aims nice. to promote African solutions to African problems. So when we return from this very short break, the professor will be sharing some insights on how best we can utilize religion in political discourse or not. Don't go away. We're still looking at religion as a political tool in Africa. We've been looking at some of the issues around this. I still have the prop with me. Uh, the original question I had for this part of the conversation was to ask you um, what your position would be on the separation of politics and religion when it comes to governance. But because you've made uh, your position a little um, on that, you said that there should be an interconnection. So I'm going to rephrase and now ask, should there be areas where there is a clear demarcation between religion and politics in the governance of the people? Uh, okay. Uh, uh, thank or, you very or rather, much. what should determine the degree of separation? Okay. Yeah, let, let, let me say that we have to look at some levels. For example, you say religion and politics. You say religion and governance. They are two different things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm looking at I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it from uh, uh, politics and religion, the relationship, and then I'm looking at how that because it is the people at the end of the day, the players in religion and is the people at the end of the day, and they are getting the um, the outcome of whatever relationship. And for me, that's governance. So I'm asking the separation. What degree should be that there be? First, we have to go back to constitutions. Okay. We have to go back to constitutions and start to determine how we want religion and politics, religion and uh, political uh, process, and religion and governance to interact. We cannot pretend. We, we, you see, it's enough for pretense in Africa. When you say you are, you are, you are operating a secular, uh, a secular uh, environment, and then you are also, at the same time, using religion as a denominator in your policies, it's wrong. We must state it clearly and be able to put it in practice. The problem is always that we have a constitutional provision that is 
very, very good and looks very good on paper. But when you go among the people and you want to test it, or you also go among the leaders and you seek to test it, you will discover that we have not been faithful to our own constitution. Look at the Nigeria, for example. In section 10 of our constitution, said it clearly, no religion shall be adopted as a state religion. It does not say that Nigeria is a secular state. Some people will tell you that it is implied. And then you look at other sections of the, of, of the same constitution, you start to wonder, what, why is it that government is empowered to provide an enabling environment for Nigerians to practice their religion? And one, that excuse of providing an enabling environment is why we have what you call National Ecumenical Center in Abuja today and the National Mosque in Abuja today. And that is why some states and even federal government invest in pilgrimages for Islam, for Christianity, as the case may be. So the first thing is go back into the constitution, spell it clearly, the level that you think religion should interfere in governance. That's number one. What level should also be allowed in terms of religion getting involved in political processes? I mean, I'm thinking about election. And then what level, again, should be the interaction between religion and politics? Politics as a concept on its own. And that way we'll be able to draw lines and say, okay. that, look, don't cross this line. If you cross this line, then you will no longer be practicing politics as it's supposed to be so there there is there is i mean as we we're talking i was thinking about the uh network is cutting us but i i hope you can hear me as we we're talking i was thinking about the um, uh, earlier conversation we talked about uh, politics religion and governance the people are at the middle of it so what happens when in, when we started democratization and trying to get away from colonialism the people who were civil rights activists were religious leaders. Um, most of them were religious leaders. And the reason most of them got involved is when they saw the suffering of the people that, you know, the, the flock that they were uh, leading. So if we do have some laws or rules separating them, what happens when the suffering of the people seem so overwhelming? Should religious leaders stay away from the conversation about the welfare of the people or should they become involved in politics and what does that pertain for us i mean it's a complex question but i mean you're the, the scholar here <laughs> you, you, I mean, that question uh, reminds me of professor uh i think Archbishop matthew kuka uh kuka has said it clearly there's no way it's written in any scriptures, Christianity or, yeah, or, the, or Islam, that religious leaders should not get involved in politics. In our, in our history, we know of Apaku, we know of uh, the former governor of Benue State, who was a pastor and who also was uh, involved in, uh, in governance. He became the governor of the state. And then that is that. And they will even tell you portions of their scriptures that stated clearly and made it mandatory for the, the, the religious leader to speak to the political leaders, bringing them into a consciousness as to what they are doing right and what they are not doing right. And let me say that this is why you have some uh, groups like Ansar Udin Society of Nigeria, like uh, the Nawaru Din Society of Nigeria, coming out to talk politics, coming out to give political positions, and you have the synod of Anglican Church in Nigeria, the Catholic Church in Nigeria, the Methodist Church in Nigeria, going into social activism in some cases and responding to the political situations in, in our country. And thereby, at the end of the day, speaking the truth, what they call the truth. I want that truth in quote, because some of them even speak sometimes out of context, that you want to all even wonder that are they patron patrons or of the government, yeah, or they are already <laughs> sympathizing with the people. You remember uh, 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 Sunday Bank of the Methodist Church. He was one of the leading voice against the military in, in the twilight uh, days of the military in Nigerian politics. Okay, um, I mean, we can't conclude this conversation without talking about peace and the role of religion there is. I read a piece on, in the course of this conversation about why religion facilitates war and how it also facilitates peace. Either way you look at it, it seems there is trouble on the horizon. But in, in trying to conclude this conversation, I'd like us to look 
at the positives. And I like your thoughts here. What are some of the ways religion can be used exclusively, perhaps, as a tool for peace in a troubled continent like Africa? Well, the, 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 for me, the thing is, if you must use religion <clears throat> to solve this social problem and economic problem as the case may be, I think you have to go back to the scriptures of these religions, whether oral scriptures or written scriptures. If you go back to these uh, scriptures, you will find it, 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 I mean, very simple. They are stated clearly there. First thing you must have is that as individual, you must remove greed. You must promote contentment. You must be able to accept that this is your limit in life. It's a, a person who did not <clears throat> have education beyond secondary school level, who aspire to be a billionaire, what do you expect? Is he not looking for an avenue to go into things that are beyond his own level? And where this is the situation, where people are not contented with what they have, there's definitely going to be agitations. <clears throat> and when agitations become the order of the day, especially when the people now start seeing political leaders becoming ostensibly rich, and not only being rich, they also display this richness, this wealth, to the detriment of the people. As a snack to the people, the people start to react and start saying that, how am I also going to be rich? And then it becomes practical. They want to steal. They want to kidnap. They want to go into banditry so that they also can be rich. So the first thing we have to go back to is that, are you contented? Are you going to accept your position that, look, this is our God that I serve. I've created me, and this is the limit that God has, that I serve wants me to reach. Of course, all of us are not going to be professors. All of us will not be teachers. All of us cannot be medical doctors. All of us cannot be nurses. We cannot be engineers and the rest of it. So some people must do the other side of the job. But then aspiration, there's nothing wrong in aspiring to be up there. But when your aspiration now goes beyond your limits, it's going to turn into something else. So if you mm -hmm. ask me, I think to avoid war and to embrace peace, there's need for us to start as an individual by accepting our situation and know that this is the limit we can go. Right. Now, at the level of governance, there should be sincerity. There should be sincerity of purpose. There should be an opportunity for the people to see that, look, the person that is leading us is sincere and is doing it within his own limit as well okay. and within the limit that the state resources can take it. Okay. It is when the people see that, oh, there is much and there is suffering within plenty. That is when they want to say, no, 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 no. Okay. We, want, we want a change. I, 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 I really would want you to. Drive us towards <laughs> peace. So I, I see peace, I see religion as a matrix that can move a nation and any nation in Africa, for that matter, to the level of achieving peace that is good for governance, economic posterity, and then stability in the polity. I must say thank you very much, uh, Professor Ogunchola Danuye Laguda for your very, very precise contributions on the program. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here, and uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, Walsh. Our pleasure, too. Now, conversations, as you can, I mean, you must have seen it in the course of this conversation. Religion and politics is often polarizing. There is no doubt about it, precisely because they deal with important matters that are deeply personal and close to our passion. These conversations should not be, they shouldn't be combative. I certainly hope that today's submissions from Professor Danoye Laguda will come in useful in subsequent discussions on the interconnectedness between religion and politics and how we can use it for the good of Africa. At the end of the day, that's what we want. I too, like Nelson Mandela, dreams of an Africa which is in peace with itself. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next week.